There are hundreds of different categories of software tests, such as performance tests, functional tests, visual tests, usability tests, and a bunch of others. But out of all these categories, there are four that keep showing up in most projects. They are static tests, unit tests, integration tests, and end-to-end -end tests. In this video, we'll go over each of these four most popular categories so you will be able to understand their differences and decide which ones you should use in your project. Spoiler alert, you should be using all of them. I'm Lucas Paganini, and in this channel, we release web development tutorials. Consider subscribing if you're interested in that. You can follow the code examples in this video by cloning the public GitHub repository in the description. First things first, what is software testing? Software testing is the process of evaluating software to make sure it avoids regressions and doesn't introduce new bugs. In other words, it's just making sure the software does what it's supposed to do. There are many ways of doing that. If you want to know all of them, you can check out the references in the description. In this video, we'll explore the four most popular options, static tests, unit tests, integration tests, and end-to-end -end tests. A static test means that we are testing our code without executing it. That's why it's called static. We can use this to catch typos, type errors, and a lot of other needs. Here are some examples of static tests. First, linting. Linting is the process of checking your source code to enforce stylistic conventions and safety measures. This is done using a lint tool, also known as linter. Linters are available for most languages. Some renowned linters are ESLint, CSSLint, and PyLint. Okay, okay, Lucas, just show me the code. All right, here's an example of how a rule from ESLint would work. In this example, we're using the ESLint no var rule to enforce the usage of let and const statements instead of var statements. So, what's going on here? ESLint is statically analyzing our code without executing it to ensure that we're not using var. But since we are using var, ESLint is yelling at us. This is just one very simple example of a linting check, but linters are way more powerful than that. They can check a thousand different rules, and you can also write your own custom rules if necessary. You can even have autofix for some linting rules, such as automatically replacing var statements with lat or const statements. Another exciting thing that you can do is create a base linter configuration, and then you can reuse that configuration in all your projects. Many companies do that. Facebook, Airbnb, and others have created their own style conventions and linting configurations that enforce those style conventions. Then they reuse those linting rules for their projects. But enough with linting. Next up is type checking. In programming languages, we have strong and weak type systems. When the type system is strong, the compiler warns you in the event of typos and errors. But when the type system is weak, like in JavaScript, some mistakes are hard to detect. An example of a strong type language is TypeScript. In TypeScript, if you have a function that expects numbers as its arguments, TypeScript won't let you give it a string you will make sure that you give it a number. But the same code in JavaScript won't give you any warnings because you can't set parameter types in JavaScript. Since you can't tell JavaScript that a function expects numbers, you will have no problem accepting strings. Sometimes that will be fine and your code will indeed work properly. And other times things might behave unexpectedly. Finally, other tools help ensure code quality by analyzing our code and providing valuable insights. Suits like SonarCube, PHPMetrics, or Spotbugs can provide metrics such as vulnerability reports, testing coverage reports, and feedback about technical depth. These checks are called static code analysis. And can you guess? One technology that can do not only type checking, but also static code analysis? TypeScript. 
Damn right, I love TypeScript. TypeScript is also able to do static code analysis. For example, it can detect misuse of the delete operator. Here, TypeScript is warning us to not use the delete operator on a variable. See, this is different than type checking. In this case, TypeScript sees that you're making a mistake. But this mistake is not based on a type check. It's based on how the delete operator was meant to be used. That's why this example fits into the static analysis category, not the type checking category. Besides the examples I gave so far, there are many other types of static tests, such as informal reviews, walkthroughs, technical reviews, inspections, you name it. The thing is, all of these practices involve analyzing your code without executing it. Now, let's talk about unit tests. Unit tests involve testing the smallest units of your code. A unit is usually just a function in functional programming or a class in object-oriented programming. But it can also be something else because you decide what a unit means. Got it? <laughs> you, unit, ah, that's terrible, sorry. But yeah, don't get hung up in unit being either a function or a class. You decide what a unit means. Take into account the context of your project. If you're working on a blog, you could say that each article is a unit. But enough with concepts. Let's see a simple example of a unit test. Given a function called sum that takes two numbers and returns their sum, we could write some unit tests. For example, calling sum with 1 and 2 should return 3. Calling sum with minus 3 and 10 should return 7. And that's how the code would look like in a real unit test. Now that we have written our unit tests, the next step is to run them. For that, we use a test runner. Some popular JavaScript test runners are Jasmine and Jest. If you're following along with the GitHub repository, I configured it to run our unit tests using Jasmine. Just run npm test and you will see that all our tests are passing. While unit testing is about testing an individual unit in isolation, integration testing is about testing that a combination of units can work together. To illustrate that, let's say that we have a function called showUserName that returns the name of a user. But this function uses another function called findUserById to actually find this user. An integration test for these two modules will look like this. Here, we are checking that the two functions are properly working together to give us the correct answer. And just like our unit test, we can run our integration test with Jasmine. This is a very simple example. As I said before, you define what a unit means. We can get way more complicated than that. For example, we could write integration tests that simulate HTTP requests to a server. But you get the idea. We just want to make sure that the units can work together. So far, we've been neck deep looking at our code, and that is dangerous because we can easily lose sight of the final picture. Lucas, what are you talking about? Let's get out of our code editor and picture ourselves as real users. A real user won't mind if we pass the wrong parameter to a function or if we're receiving the correct data from an API call. The user is only interested in what he can actually see and interact with. Static, unit, and integration tests can give us a false sense of confidence. You may think it's all good because your unit tests are passing, but what really matters is whether things are working for the end user. And for that, we have end-to-end -end tests, also known as E2E. End-to-end -end tests are all about testing the end user interaction, but instead of hiring humans, we can use a tool that simulates our users. An end-to-end -end test runner will run tests against your entire application using the same interface as your end users. For example, a web application runs in the browser, so your end-to-end -end test runner should interact with your application using a browser, just like a real user. Cypress is a very popular and modern end-to-end -end test runner for browsers. Let's see an example end-to-end -end test written for Cypress. In this case, we want to test that if a user visits our fruit application, 
he can see the correct title of the website and the correct list of fruits. Running this test is not as simple as running unit or integration tests, because as I said before, end-to-end -end tests require your application to be fully running. In our case, our application is a simple file server, and we can start it by running npm start. Now that our application is alive, we can run our end-to-end -end tests against it. Talking specifically about Cypress, there are two ways of running our tests. First, using the Cypress command line interface, the CLI. And second, using the Cypress graphical user interface, the GUI. Running the tests with the Cypress CLI is very similar to how we've been doing things so far. You simply execute Cypress run and it will run the tests and show the results on your terminal. But hey, if you were a real human running this test, you would be able to see the person opening Google Chrome and clicking around. And guess what? Cypress can do that. Running Cypress open will open the Cypress graphical interface. Then you can click on the fruits spec and see your browser running your test, controlled by Cypress. Now look at that. Hmm, amazing. It's so cool that you might think it's a good idea to forget about the other types of tests and just write end-to-end -end tests. And hey, I'm not gonna lie, that can work. But as you may have noticed, end-to-end -end tests take way longer than unit and integration tests. This simple test took 236 milliseconds using the Cypress CLI. That might not seem much, but imagine hundreds of these. You will quickly get into a state where it takes an hour to run all your end-to-end -end tests. To work around that, most end-to-end -end test runners allow you to throw money at the problem and run your tests in parallel, but it will never be as fast as running unit and integration tests. This means that your developers will be annoyed at how long it takes, and they will eventually stop running the tests locally because it's breaking their focus flow. Also, end-to-end -end tests require all this setup of actually running your whole application, which is yet another barrier for your developers. So here is my personal verdict, and you can ignore it if you disagree. First, I think we should have strict style conventions and use static tests to enforce them. This will save hours debating whether a new project should use tabs or spaces. Second, I think we should have fast unit and integration tests that run every time we modify a file. That way we can have quick feedback if our code breaks. And lastly, I think we should have end-to-end -end tests, particularly for the primary features of our application. No matter how many unit and integration tests I have, end-to-end -end tests are necessary. Personally, I would not feel confident deploying an application without running some end-to-end -end tests first. Don't stop here! If you want to dive deeper into software testing or the technologies used in this video, such as JavaScript, TypeScript, and Cypress, consider subscribing to our newsletter at lucaspaganini.com. It's spam-free, we keep the emails few and valuable. And if your company is looking for remote web developers, please consider contacting my team. You can do so at lucaspaganini.com. As always, references are in the description. Like, subscribe, have a great day, and I will see you in the next one.